welcome, Kurt. Okay, you got to let me know how to pronounce your last name. I don't want to butcher it. It's, it's Nabig. Nabig. So, you know, sometimes people would say, because I'm a short guy, they'd be like, he's about Nabig. <laughs> And that's why that'll help you remember you know yeah right so okay here's the thing. are you originally from um chicago illinois yes i am grew up uh south side moved to cicero and then later on to lagrange so i've been in chicago area all my life except for a, a brief jaunt to new york to go to school and i also read you went to the moscow theater uh when yes yeah. uh how did that happen? How in the world did a guy from Chicago go to Moscow? It was pretty crazy. We were, uh, I was going to school at Juilliard and generally in the third year, they were sending people off to do a play somewhere. And one day they gathered us all in the room and they said something very special is happening. Uh, you guys were sending you all to Russia. You're going to do your play there, but you're going to study at Moscow School of the Arts while you're there and we, our minds were blown because it was 1989 and it was before um, before Yeltsin rode into Red Square on a tank. This was, right. you know, communist right. Russia. And uh, so we, it was love, the people were lovely. We had a great time. It was very hard to eat. There was not a lot of food. Um, so I went there weighing about 140 pounds, uh, which is pretty skinny for me even then, and I came back weighing about 125. Um, oh, that's a way yeah. to lose weight. Um, I had a great time, but I was really happy to eat some junk food when I came back home. Cheeseburgers and everything, right? Yes, ma'am. Did you learn about vodka? Are, are there different kinds of vodka that you've had? To um, there was a lot of vodka, but I don't know one from another. Everybody wanted to drink vodka all the time. <laughs> that was hysterical. Now, is acting was acting the first um, kind of like thing that you wanted to do for as long as you can remember? No, uh, that kind of came about in a strange way. I'm the first thing I wanted to do was uh, at a very young age I became a, a skateboard uh, champion in the Midwest and at a about at, at the age of 13, it's kind of a weird side story, but at age 13, I opened up a skateboard shop at the beginning of the skateboard craze in the 1970s. Me and another 15, I was 13 and my buddy was 15 and we opened up a store and we became like successful and well known in like a very short period of time. And that was my dream. And that I did that for about three years. I bought them out a year later. Uh, did it for about three years, uh, crashed and burned as a kid with way too much money, way too fast. And uh, <laughs> later on, acting happened uh, in my senior year of high school. Um, I was still skateboarding semi-pro and uh, still a bit of a troublemaker. And I went past a classroom where people were acting. It looked like they were acting but I realized there was a large group of people. It was the last period of the day. They were all milling around. And I thought if I sign up for that class, I can sneak out and my day will end one period earlier. <laughs> so I signed up for Just what was called- out? Yeah, improv and mime class. And uh, I got in there and strangely I got bit by the bug and in fact, the thing I loved the most about that class was mime. I think at one point I thought I may really have a future in mime. <laughs> anyway, uh, from there I ended up going on and continuing acting, but that was how I got started. It was unexpected. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, uh, the senior year in high school, I know Chicago has a very, um, how do you call this? We're, ex we're looking in different schools in Chicago for performing arts because of my daughter, but Mm -hmm. um how do you call this did you go to the performing arts in in chicago in high school no and uh, no so regular... i was in i i by that point in time i had moved to lagrange i had chicago okay. then cicero and then lagrange and so mm -hmm. that was the high school i was in although i've known some people went to performing arts high school and uh, really loved it yeah i know it's kind of like uh uh 
based on my daughter's experiences right now, you, yeah. I usually tell her the nice thing about you being in theater. She's theater. She's musical theater. They're very tight. You're, you guys are very close, tight yes. kind of group. And, and this is, um, it's just that you support each other. And I think this goes to everybody who's into theater or into performing arts in general. All right. I totally so, agree. So, did you go straight from, did you have to do theater? How long did you do theater before switching to television or voiceover? So, um, so I did theater for a while, then I ended up going to drama school a few years later. Um, and I think just before I left for drama school in 1986, I, mm -hmm. uh, I got cast in a couple of, uh, couple of movies. One was a low budget movie that became kind of a, a cult hit. And then the other one was a made for TV movie. I was playing young kind of crazy bad guys. That was what I started out with. I was telling my daughter the other day, you know, the guys that are really bad people on, tele on television, the villains, are usually graduates of Juilliard. I said, like, look at Wes, <laughs> look at Wes Bentley. Wes Bentley, yeah. Yeah, Mikkel mm -hmm. Pfeiffer. I mean, yeah. dude, that, that yeah. kid is really bad and PD, but you love him. Uh, but, you know, that, I said, like, you kind of, and she loves being villain. On, on theater, Fun. she loves villain roles. You know, she goes like, I said, you have, you have a, I said like, you have a potential on being in Juilliard because all the people in Juilliard are, gets to be the bad villain on television. So you, uh, go going back to Moscow, did yeah. you get to perform in Moscow while being in school? Yeah, we got to perform. We had we had written a play uh, that had toured um, New York City public high schools, and huh? when we got there, we did that show. It was called In Transit, and it took place inside uh, the Port Authority bus terminal. Um, so it was it was funny and compelling, and a little bit sad, and had some music, and so we brought that there and. They showed us some of the things they were working on. It was an, it was really a, a wonderful time. Now, did you get to learn Russian at all? Yet. <laughs> no. Uh, I learned a few words, but I, I must admit now, who, I didn't learn a lot. You know? How did that, how did school, how, the, how did you get over school when you're in Russia learning and not so everything was taught in English. Was that it? So generally they had um, uh, people who were translating, but back oh. then many of the translators were also KGB. So they were there to watch and see You're what kidding we were me, up right? to. No, is that a real? Oh no, absolutely not. <laughs> as soon as you would leave uh, your apartment, you would be followed anywhere you go went, somebody was following you. Um, yeah, it was, it was quite, it was Have you thought fun of, and weird and, you know, I mean, it really did, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead. it was fun. Uh, it, it was just fun and weird and nothing like anything we had ever seen or understood. You would say something about the news and somebody would go, it's propaganda. And I would think, how sad to be in a country where there's propaganda everywhere. And then, you know, um, now I, uh, I look at our country and go, uh-oh, um, mm -hmm. but enough said right. there. Yeah, all right. Now, have you ever thought of writing a book about your experiences in Russia? A student, no, an American uh, student in Russia. <laughs> no, I, I, kept, I, I kept track of some things, but uh, I, wrote a, I wrote a solo show just this year but it oh. deals more with some of the stuff I already told you about. It's uh, it's like the story of me opening a skateboard shop at 13 and what happens when a kid gets success beyond his wildest dreams and then blows everything apart. And it also deals with recovery and it's set against mm -hmm. like the background of a former 
semi-pro skateboarder returning to the skate park in his middle age. So that's kind of uh, the show. It's funny and, and weird and different. Are you going to have it published or like um, it? Yeah, I, I, did a, I did a reading of it not too long ago and a number of theaters were interested. So I was super excited and then the pandemic hit. It was like four days before everything closed down in Chicago. So the most recent thing, almost everybody kind of dropped from that, but uh, there's one solo uh, festival that said, we're gonna do it all online. Do you wanna do it uh, online? And it's highly likely that's what's gonna happen. Um, so- You're gonna let me know, copy. right? So we can watch? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I, I guess one of my, uh, one of the most common question that I normally ask an actor is like, who has been, who has been doing almost every genre there is. Um, do you have a preference? Uh, theater, television, voiceover, film? Um, so it's interesting. As time has gone on, I direct quite a bit. And mm -hmm. I think I enjoy directing theater and film best. And I think the reason, particularly like I enjoy directing comedy. Uh, okay. There's nothing like sitting there all day and uh, laughing your butt off while people are trying different things to be funny. Um, I just enjoy the heck out of directing uh, comedy. I, I still do love acting on stage and acting on film, but, uh, but directing is the thing that's just become more fun for me. I think I have less stress about it. Most people I know have more really? stress about directing, but for me, usually particularly if I'm doing a, a, even if it's film, but a play certainly, every night I come in and I watch and I feel things getting incrementally better. And as an actor, a lot of times you walk in and you know where you wanna be, Mm -hmm. And immediately you're brought up against the fact that you're not there and you start yeah, to panic. Right. right? And right. so for me, a rehearsal process is often about me hiding my internal fear that everything's all going to fall apart before opening. You know, I do a pretty good job of hiding it, but I'm going home going, oh my God, this is never going to work. Oh God. You know, uh, and when I'm directing, I'm like, okay, they did this tonight. It's not exactly what I wanted, but we're moving forward. And so I feel good. And if it's comedy, I'm laughing too. So you can't beat that. All right. So we know uh, everybody, well, everybody is more, um, how do you, how am I going to say? Everybody is uh, uh, familiar with Kurt, the actor. So who is mm -hmm. Kurt, the director? Um, I don't know if I could say who he is, but I think, um, I think most people like to have me as a director because as an actor, I understand the process. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm trying to head toward a look and a feel for a show and what the show means. But I also know how to work with actors because I've been one, I know how to talk to them. And, you know, I think one of the gripes actors often have is they get, um, when you get a director who spent all their life directing and knows nothing about acting, is their direction is often totally result oriented and they don't know how to put it to you. A lot of times they tell you what not to do. And the worst thing on stage is to have somebody go, okay, so when you get up there, don't look weird and when you talk, uh, don't over enunciate, but you know, don't sound too sloppy. And the next thing you know, you're, you're editing yourself as you're doing it and you can't really be in the moment. And I think one of the things that, that good directors do, and I, I, I hope I'm one, is to try to help people understand what they can do, um, what they should do, what will make it look better and be easier for them rather than what they shouldn't do. Um, yeah. And so that's part of what I do. And I'm a huge fan. People love watching me laugh at their show or weep when they act well on stage, so. I guess that makes you a good, a better director, being on both sides of the fence too. I think it does. Now, have you kind of like, uh, have you casted uh, a person that you thought in the beginning he was, 
he or she was good in a in a character or in a role mm-hmm. then eventually uh it's not really working out right now how do you deal with that or have you dealt with that or you haven't had those experiences yet i've had people sometimes disappoint me a bit right okay. uh yeah. but usually through the re- through the audition process i will know that they're capable of it you know mm-hmm. Uh, but sometimes people will, you know, may disappoint just because they maybe get in their own way. They start stressing about things that they don't need to, or they're trying so hard to be good that they do the opposite, right? Mm-hmm. Sometimes people want so much for everybody to like them that they become self-conscious. And um, I think the, about the only problem I've really run into, because usually those things can be worked on, fixed. Uh, worked with and, you know, uh, and make them, you know, make everything be fine. I've not had to, um, I've not had to hire somebody and and fire them or anything like that. Um, But occasionally you run into somebody who is just not a a fun person to be around. Yeah. Right. Right. And that's the thing that's the hardest, right? When, when you're with somebody and you've got a group of actors who are wonderful and fun and nice and all get along. And then there's somebody who isn't that. Doesn't really right. Now, here's my thing. A lot of people, I guess, don't really talk about it. Uh, for somebody who's directing theater, um, how important is an understudy? Uh, it can be very important. Um, it's rare. Uh-huh. But when it happens, and if you don't have an understudy, you're in trouble, you know? Um, there was a show I did about four years ago where the lead was six foot eight inches tall. And I was told no understudy. And at the end of the first week, he walked on stage and just walked funny and broke his leg and could no longer finish the show. And that was the end okay. of the show. It was a uh, really? it, it was a farce with lots and lots of physical comedy and fights and things like that. Stuff that you can't put together in a week. You just couldn't. So, um, so that, was the, that was the situation. <laughs> no, I don't. I apologize here. <laughs> no, no, I'll mute. No, <laughs> don't worry about it. There we no. go. Uh, now, um, what? advice do you give to young actors whether that's be on television or in theater um, normally i usually ask this um i deal with a lot of well i meet a lot of uh young actors who's mm-hmm. starting whether people that i interview or you know what is the best advice that a court would give to sitting down with a bunch of actors young actors who wanted to pursue whether that's television well most of them would be want to be famous but right in general what kind what advice would you give them i think most people want things to work out immediately Mm -hmm. and that's not generally the way it goes so um i would recommend that people study as much as they can and do as much work as they can early on in their careers. And that usually means you're working for little or no money in the beginning. You'll be That's doing right. stage work or films for very little money, you know, working with friends, doing, uh, uh, doing student films, whatever you can to start getting better and honing your craft so that when the moment comes where somebody asks you to audition for something you really, really want, you are experienced mm-hmm. enough and relaxed enough um, and able enough to make that happen. And I think a lot of people are either busy thinking, I need my money now, or why aren't people paying attention to me? I don't want to do that other stuff because it's not very good or exciting to me. I want the good stuff. And the good stuff, um, I, I think that the thing we got to remember, those of us who are actors, is the good stuff is that on a given day, we get to do something that we love. And sometimes we do it for little or no money. Sometimes we do it because we just adore the people we're working with or the material. And sometimes we do it because we get paid well. But if you do it because you love it, eventually, 
uh, stick around, have some tenacity, and you will get paid. But it was a while before I was making a living at it. How long is a while? <laughs> How long was your waiting process? <laughs> I'm thinking, I, I remember, uh, so I was working at the Board of Trade uh, Options Exchange uh, okay. when I decided I wanted to be an actor. So I saved enough money at age 19 to quit my job and live for her without, without making any money, right? So I saved that money and I thought, good, at the end of the year, when I'm doing really well as an actor, everything will be fine. And I remember telling my acting teacher that and she went, <laughs> and I thought, right. that's not a good sign, right? So right. I think it was probably close to, getting close to five years before I was starting to, you know, make a reasonable living and reasonable living meant I was, I still had a side job for a while. It wasn't until after I got out of uh, drama school that I started really being able to get rid of the side hustles and just, mm -hmm. just act, just do voiceover, just do commercials, film, whatever, you know. Okay. Now, uh, getting off of drama school, how important uh, the choice of a school where to go? Uh, well, related to being quote unquote hired or starting to get what you say getting paid how important of that like you know people are, oh I'm gonna go to Juilliard we all know right. that it's not easy to go to Juilliard but any any performing arts or conservatory school have their own kind of like set of requirements and not everybody is into that but how important is that compared to some like what they call the Disney way of going to um, being on, on film or in television. You're cute, you get to Disney, you do a couple of shows and you forget school. That exists. And you rely that you're going to have Disney the entire way. Sometimes that can happen. If life comes up and starts offering you jobs and the jobs pay well and you're happy, hey, Maybe you're not gonna have to go to school or maybe you're gonna do that later if that's something that you want, right? Um, that was not the case for me, you know? I was a character guy from the get-go and I knew that, you know, that uh, everything wasn't just gonna come to me, right? right. I remember doing right. my first film and I was working with another character guy and, and he's like, he said to me, he was a young guy and he's like, look, I know you think uh, after you do this, this every for you for the next movie he says you know what it's not gonna happen Kurt and I thought what a jerk and he then he pointed <laughs> to the two other two other chairs of the pretty actors that were working with us who had less experience but uh were about the same age he said they're gonna come looking for those two and yeah. he was right about one you know mm -hmm. and it did take me longer and it took him longer to kind of get rolling in the business um so uh, I don't know. Sometimes the world tells you this is what you got to do. Sometimes not. As far as the school goes, um, I was kind of educating at, a, at an acting uh, studio in Chicago, right? Which mm -hmm. at the time it was called the Audition Center. Now it's called Acting Studio Chicago. And I teach there now. But I was, I was taking my classes there and uh, the teacher said, you know, she encouraged me to try out for Juilliard, Yale and NYU. And she said, look, if you get into one of those schools and you do your four years there, that's gonna mean something on your resume in the future. I don't know what it'll provide for you, but it will mean something, right? Some of the other schools, she says, you're gonna get an education there, but it's not the kind of thing where somebody's gonna look at your resume and go, I need to pay more attention to this person, right? Um, right. Is that fair or right? I don't know. I got lucky. I, I auditioned for Juilliard, Yale, and NYU the first year, and I blew all three of the auditions. I knew it 30 seconds into each one of the auditions. And I dragged myself home, and I, my teacher had told all my friends that I was doing it. Ooh. So for about a year, people were saying, how did your Juilliard and Yale audition go, Kurt? And I'd have to go, not well. <laughs> and... The following year, I decided um, I just wanted to acquit myself. I thought, I've, I'm better. 
Okay. Uh, I, I worked on a lot of things and I thought if I can go in and do what I consider my best work and they say, no, I'm okay with that. You know, mm -hmm. and all I had was the money to, um, that year, all I had was the money to apply for Juilliard, not Yale or NYU. So I just applied for Juilliard. I got my, I got my application in with one day to spare. And I oh. went in and I got in. And, um, you know, so that was super fortunate, kind of lucky. I just got some lucky breaks along the way. Looking back, there's a number of things that kind of helped to make that happen that I was unaware of at the time and uh and I'm super grateful yeah so going did that lead you directly uh to stage or did you have to go through well of course you, you have an agent by the time right yeah yeah I had already done a couple of films before I went to school Ooh. and then during the summer I think two of the years I booked something else on film along the way. My last year there, I had to go in and kind of beg. I got cast in a movie with Roger Daltrey from the rock group, The Who. And mm -hmm. um, I had to go into school and they didn't make a habit of letting people out to do movies. That was a big no-no back then. And I went in and said, I got cast in this thing. And I kind of like was very Please. nice. Yeah. And, and you know, is it possible? Is there a way? for me and they were like, well, you know, uh, if you do it, we were gonna put you in this play, we're gonna have to give you a much smaller role in this play and you'll get a, a decent role in this other play uh, and we can make it work. It's a good thing that you knew a few months in advance. If you wanna do it, go do it. So I went and did it. Uh, in that movie, I played a guy who didn't, um, didn't speak most of the time. He literally <laughs> barked like a dog, <laughs> literally. And at my audition, the British director, you know, Said, hey, we just saw you. Uh, we just saw you real. You're looking great. Um, everything's good. Um, so, uh, Kurt, you want to bark for us? And so I went <laughs> a couple of times, and they laughed, and they went, "All right." And I walked out, and about 15 minutes later, I heard I had the job. Um, the movie itself is pretty bad. It's pretty bad. Hey, um, it's a resume but, builder. It was a gig. I got to spend a little bit of time with a, uh, at the time, one of my rock heroes and hear a few stories right. about what it was like to be in the who and, uh, and, uh, right. you know, that helped me have enough money to tide me over to the next job. I think one of my questions that I, uh, that I sent you, I asked something like to affect, especially now, um, how much of uh, the decision-making on accepting role does your agent play? Um, I'm not famous enough that they're like getting in there. Most of my agents are like, take it. Hey, you think you're not famous enough? You have no idea. You should talk to your Chicago PD fans. Hello. But yeah, but you know, people think, and this is, this is the funny thing that I talk to actors. Most mm -hmm. of the actors that I kind of interview are, uh, which I do prefer personally, are people that makes, I hate to say the word, but they call it the secondary roles. But I said, if it wasn't yeah. for the secondary role actor, your other actor, okay, Voight won't look good if you didn't do that. Hello, uh, excuse me. That, that's just the right. thing. So, I, I mean, on, on film, some. You know, I film sometimes, you know, our job is to make the, uh, make the attractive person look more attractive by being attracted to them, uh, to make the person who's the badass look more intimidating by letting them scare us, uh, to come up against them in Chicago uh, PD, to come up against the tough guy and be a real hard head opposite him to give him some serious conflict I right. mean, that becomes right. our job and sometimes you know sometimes we're looking at it as a role but some uh, at times we are what we what you would call a functionary and so we're playing the role but we also have a function within the script to you know move it forward you know i'm going to be the guy right. who suddenly breaks and confesses i'm going to be the guy who uh loses it after he sees this horrible murder um, and then the hero comes in and goes, 
all right, Kurt, calm down. We're going to get the bad guy. And I go, okay, thanks. You know, that's so sometimes that's our job, you know? So you're saying you're, uh, when, when your phone call, when you get a phone call, Hey, you're going to be in PD. It's more of like, yeah, okay, I'm going to do it. And your agent just, Oh, go for it. Usually that my agent isn't usually fighting with me about the agent. The agent wants 10%, right? Of course. Of so course. that's what they really want. Now, the thing I'm usually most roles, I'm like, uh, I'll probably do it, but I also want to get paid what I get paid. So that's right. where sometimes things uh, come into play where I'm like, here's what I want to make. And they may say, we don't want to pay that. And then we go back and forth and, you know, um sometimes i do it sometimes i don't you know um, now, so that's kind of okay. how that works covid 19 how do how are you i mean i know the fact i know i'm and i know people here in hawaii well yeah. i know actors who are here in hawaii dealing with it how are you dealing with it right now as an actor it's it's tough um there's not a lot of work going on right now. I'm doing a voiceover gig though on Saturday and I'm getting paid to do a play reading via Zoom on Sunday. Um, and um, things are starting to roll with a couple TV shows in the mm-hmm. Chicago area. So things are starting up, we'll see. Um, I've used the time because I wrote that solo show I thought, well, I guess I'm going to memorize that thing. So I've spent a lot of time. I've got two thirds of a 90 minute show memorized now with all the free time that I've had. But, um, (laughs) you know, before COVID, I was auditioning anywhere from like four to eight times a week. Now, mostly it's uh, it's zero times a week. So that's kind of how things have been. We're hoping it changes. Does it bring out the, does it bring out the creative? more on a person who's in quarantine? Um, I think so. I mean, it depends. It really depends, right? right. So for me, yes, I'm more creative. I'm writing a little bit more. I'm excited about different things. I was prepping a couple plays I was directing and those fell through because of COVID too, but I still got the prep done. Um, But, you know, I'm in a position now in my career where I'm not I'm not absolutely lost if I don't make money. Okay. And I've still got a side hustle that I do for fun. So, so I'm okay there, but uh, a lot of my friends are not in that position and they are freaking out because Mm -hmm. we don't know when does this end or what does it look like for the next six months, year, year and a half. Nobody knows. Um, can I ask you a Chicago PD question? Sure. How was that? I, I, yeah, you, I mentioned to you, and I had to watch it again, uh, all your Chicago episodes. Mm-hmm. But I think the more intense one was um, the one that you have with Jason and mm-hmm. John, and of course, um, Robert Wilson, the guy who plays Commander Perry. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, how was that experience? I know you oh. guys have you been you have you you've been with Jason a couple of episodes. Right. And, At that point, um, I've been with Jason a couple episodes. Yeah, I was on uh, episode one and two, and mm-hmm. then we moved to this one, and this is the one where you know, boom, I get killed, boom. right? Right. Um, right. So, spoiler alert. Sorry, guys, but if. If you're watching season one now, you missed it a few years ago. I watch so, it this much. All right. Okay. Um, so it was exciting. I mean, number one, when I heard Robert Wisdom was in it, I was so excited because I'd seen him on The Wire and I just thought the right. world of him. Right. And he was a great guy to work with. Um, it was exciting. Uh, you know, we had a fight in one of the scenes. It, it looked like it took about all of about two seconds when you actually saw it, but the three of us were wrestling the hell out of each other. And at one point in time, unfortunately, um, somebody knocked Robert Wisdom down so hard. He was, you know, landed on his back. Jason had a back problem. I mean, it was, uh, 
it, it was a bit of a mess for everybody, but we were, you know, we're a bunch of dudes who were like, oh, I got it, I'm fine, you know? And then you watch somebody kind of hobble to their car after, you know, after it. Um, it was uh, it was bittersweet for me because I knew I was getting it, and once you get it, you're gone for quite a while, if not forever. You know, um, usually. I don't know that. They can yeah, be well, creative. <laughs> well, the way um, Dick Wolf works with those shows is generally, right. if you've been on a show, uh, you cannot be on one of the that show or any other show for at least two years, and I think because I played such a kind of intense character. Yeah, kind of an important role for the, first, for the first, for the first thing, you know, I had to wait, it was about three and a half years before I got another audition. And when I did, I booked it immediately. It was something on uh, uh, Chicago Fire. So I was, mm -hmm. I was excited to be back. Uh, the other thing I remember about that episode and it didn't end up in the episode, but I was super excited because I was gonna get killed and I'd never been, killed on screen before and so the guy they called pulpo was gonna grab john's right. gun put it under my chin and blow my brains out and i was like awesome right <laughs> um so they hooked up some kind of hose behind my head to shoot my brains on the back wall and they're like look we got one take on the this you better you better get it right and uh um, so they did it, you know, and you, you have to throw yourself backwards as the thing pulls and make sure the blood hits and fall a certain way. And so if there's a lot of stuff involved. I was so excited. We did it and it worked perfectly. And then they didn't put it in the show, <laughs> which is Too often common blood. when you're doing. Maybe. Too much blood. Too much blood. But, um, did you have to prepare with them, talk to them, uh, or no? It was just like, okay, let's roll with it, uh, know my lines, you know, um, shook hands, let's get it rolling. Kind of, kind of like that. <laughs> I mean, I think uh, a lot of TV works that way. They expect you to be <laughs> ready, know your stuff, be, mm -hmm. you got to be more prepared than the stars. The stars, they cut a break to because they're a star, but if you're holding things up, you're a goat, right? They're not happy. Right. Um, right. So you need to be spot on. Um, but if you get if you get the right partner, it can be a blast. I mean, I, I I think in the first episode with Jason, I had such a great time in the scene where we are busting on each other in the room, giving each other a real hard time. And I remember the director was like, "Oh my God, that was great. Uh, do you guys want to do it again?" And we were <laughs> like, "Yeah." yeah. <laughs> something okay, completely sure. different we gave right. him something completely different and he was like oh my god i got so much i can use and we both you know we're both mm -hmm. so happy we were working well together and it, it was just it, one of those experiences as an actor where you're just super um pumped that you get to work with somebody that kind of comes to play you know I got to ask you, so you mentioned earlier that um, you're a teacher, you're an acting yeah. coach. Um, normally, do you, the people that uh, go to your, uh, to the actor studio, a studio in Act, Chicago? Acting studio Chicago, yeah. Oh, right. uh, are they professional actors or is it open to like students, you know, who would want to learn the craft uh our school kind of covers the gamut so we get people okay. who sometimes are coming in uh who just are kind of like i was in high school i don't know i'll go see what this thing is right and then we get people who work all the time who come in sometimes for a tune-up um i teach an advanced class where i work with those folks, the people who are working regularly in the industry. And I also teach a, a monologue class uh, to help actors, in, at least in Chicago, the way most actors audition is with a monologue that they've memorized and gotten ready so that when they walk in an agent's office or a theater, uh, they've got a piece of material to show people. So that's the other type of class I teach, but we, we kind of run the gamut. 
Um, do you, okay, I know you asked me this question before we started recording, but I'm gonna throw back the question to you. Have you been asked, what is the weirdest question that a student have asked you? Weirdest question a student has asked me. Okay, um, gosh, I am, I'm drawing a blank. I've been asked some pretty weird questions. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes it'll be an actor and I'll think, oh, my friend, you really know nothing about acting, do you? You know what I mean? <laughs> right, but right, I'm, right. I'm, I'm super kind about it because I can absolutely remember when I knew nothing. When I got my first role and somebody said it and I heard there was this thing called, they called it blocking. And right. I thought, so blocking is moving. And so I spent, you know, days in my bedroom, just walking from one corner of my bedroom to the other, the way that we walked on the stage, because I thought that's, I mean, that was all I knew to work on, you know? Right. So sometimes you get a question like that, what is blocking or, you know, um, how do you remember all those lines? And, right. you know, right. and, and, and things like that where you, you know, um, but I can't think of anything like crazy or funny, dumb, to tell you off the top of my head right now. But I guess because of most of the people that attend your class are pretty much in the business. So there's, you know, they're there for the thing, for like serious acting business. So they're, let's get on with it, you know? So um, another, I guess, uh, having a, having been part of a, uh, my daughter's journey and still is, um, if, like me, a mom whose kid is into this kind of business or going into this business, what do you, uh, what advice to a parent or to a guardian or a sister, or just a family member, uh, do you give them? Knowing that, you know, not everybody is into very supporting, like, a child going through this kind of business? You talk right. to parents, do you talk to a partner, do you talk to a spouse? Like, I know it's kind of crazy, I know it doesn't get, it doesn't, it won't, you won't see dollar signs right away, but normally yeah. when do you have those people that come to you like, is this the right direction for them? So how old is your daughter? Mine is turning 17. Okay, so, so good. Um, it's interesting because my daughter, um, my daughter was in the business too. Um, mm -hmm. And from the time she was like a little baby, agents were clamoring. She was super cute and super friendly and agents were clamoring for her. So we went in for a couple of TV commercials and uh, she booked a couple of things, but it was a lot of hassle. And I, I, at one point I went to my agent who was um, a voiceover agent at the time and I asked her because there was, I mean, I think my daughter would have gotten cast in something big if we stuck around with it, you know? And I said, I mm -hmm. said, Sharon, what do you think about this industry for kids? And she had, she wasn't just a voiceover agent. She had been an agent for a long time. And she said, well, okay, I'll be honest with you, Kurt. And she knew my daughter by that time. She said, if your kid does voiceover, no problem awesome. They come in, they do a voiceover, they get back to school before the day's out. Mm -hmm. They live a pretty yeah. normal life. If your kid does commercials, not too much of a problem. She said, if your kid starts doing films, it's going to be a tough row to hoe as a parent. And then she said, if your kid gets a, a lead on a TV series, you've lost him forever. And that made me kind of gasp at her honesty about it. And she said, they will do anything to get a take out of your child. They will give your child anything. It doesn't matter. You will have lost them. And I went home and I told my wife and we went, mm -hmm. okay. And we said, well, let's let her do voiceover. And she had a great career in voiceover and paid for a college education with the money she wow. made doing voiceover. And she worked a lot. She worked almost every week. Um, and she was a singer too. So she did jingles for McDonald's, had jingles built around her voice 
you know? I mean, it was pretty, wow. so she had a pretty cool uh, view of the business. And when she got older, it was around age 15, 16, when, you know, we felt like if she wants to do this on camera stuff, okay, now she's, she's in a better place. And uh, she auditioned for a little while, uh, got close on a couple of things. I mean, she did maybe three or four auditions for films, right? Got close on a couple of things, and then I think she went. I don't like this life, yeah. right? And right. she and she, she decided not to do it, and uh, and so that's that's a really hard thing to say. I mean, because right. so often we look and we go, I want my kid to have that kind of success, and I, having had some crazy success as a young skateboarder and the owner of a business, you know, right. at a very young age, I did. I was fully aware of how messed up it can be for somebody who gets crazy success before they're able to handle it. Right. Now, my daughter doesn't want TV nor film. She's straight up mm -hmm. theater, musical theater. theater. And, yeah, she, and so, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, she pretty much, uh, she's a singing dance person, uh, theater, Shakespeare. She had a, she was introduced to Shakespeare and did the tempest oh, so nice. that she made she fell in love with that so she's been in like that so i'm only asking that because we most of our friends are in the theater thing and they know i talk a lot a lot uh, a lot to you know actors like you has been so i had to kind of like i usually send them whatever interview i have and i'm gonna send this to his to their acting coach so that they can you know they're acting teachers so they can you know they can watch it so and, and here's uh, what i would say about theater for kids i don't think there's any problem at all with theater that's a right, totally right. different thing than right. film and tv right and uh the right. great thing and you mentioned this early on is that generally theater groups are so accepting of people right who they are right. their differences i mean it's um it's the one community that I've felt the most accepted throughout my life. Um, and there's something really kind of wonderful and joyous about the people who are in theater. And you guys in Chicago, because I, I interviewed recently Carolyn Neff, who also appeared okay. on Chicago PD. Yes. And then, of course, uh, Amy, Amy Plot, um, Amy Trudy is also theater. Amy Morton. Amy Morton, yeah. yeah. I know so Amy. So you yeah. have that, yeah, you have that kind of, you know, um, Carolyn was telling me, she said, like, it was the sweetest thing ever. She goes, like, I met, I know Amy from theater. When she filmed Chicago PD, it was her birthday. At the end of the day, they sang for her. So I, go, uh, so I said, like, and that's, you know, that's the nice thing about being in theater. Okay, I don't want to hold up so much of your time. And one last question that I normally sure. ask people, what is, I know you're gonna tell me you don't have fans, you have fans, Kurt, please, all right? So what is your message to your, whether that's gonna be the Chicago PD fans, your Chicago Fire fans, and all of those people that has followed your career um, throughout the years? I don't, you know, uh... This is something I say when I'm teaching acting uh, to people, just in general, when they're talking about, I'm going to get started in the business or, you know, what do I have to do? How do I have to make myself? What do I have to become in order to do this? And the thing that has been the most valuable to me all along is somebody said, you are enough. Who you are, where you came from, how you grew up your sadnesses, your joys, all of that poured together to make you who you are. And that is unique. And if you own that, uh, it's hard to lose. Well, thank you so much, Kurt Nabig. And um, we're gonna chat more. I think we should do this. When you, um, when you come up with your one man, play online let me know and okay. we'll help you promote get in touch you have my number you have my email so all right amy you need help and support we will be here for you we'll be watching for you thank you so much aloha 
And Thank you. Aloha, stay Amy. Stay safe to you and your family. You too. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.